and welcome back. Uh, we're here at the Canadian Hydrogen Convention inside the Edmonton Region Hydrogen Hub Pavilion on the Edmonton Global Stage. Believe it or not, this is the final installment of our live stream over the last couple of days. We've had more than 10,000 people here from all over the world, many of whom now are our closest and best friends, and we're looking forward to bringing them back next year. Uh, the last session we're doing today is the Global Pitch Challenge. This is hosted by Plug and Play. We have a number of teams here that are competing, and Kristen Kuhn, with Plug and Play is our MC and is ready to start us off. Kristen, over to you. Amazing, thank you so much. Uh, welcome everyone, we're really excited to introduce a couple of fabulous startups today that are going to be presenting to you. And first up, we have Andrew McGovern joining us, who is the Executive VP of Nanos Tech. Welcome Andrew to the stage. Your time will be five minutes and you can start now. Thank you, Kristen. Perfect, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Andrew McGovern, Executive Vice President of Nanos Tech. Uh, we're a green chemistry company. What does that mean? Well, we take chemistry and we apply it to the energy sector, making it more efficient, affordable, cleaner for people on the planet today. And what we really like is, oh, where's my, there we go. And what we really specialize in is we have something called nanocatalysts. And what we like about nanocatalysts is that catalysts in general, they're very good at making chemical processes more efficient. And when you take catalysts and you can shrink them down very small to like the one billionth of a meter nanoscale, they become much more reactive and also more targeted and become orders of magnitude better. And when you get better catalysts, you can make energy a lot leaner and cleaner. So over the last 15 years, we've been developing a suite of nano catalysts that focus on three specific areas. One is our hydro treating catalyst, which allows us to upgrade and extract oil a lot more efficiently and cleaner. The other one is our reforming and hydronation catalyst, which allows us to produce things like renewable liquid fuels, such as renewable diesel and sustainable aviation fuel. And the last is our reforming catalyst. It allows us to basically activate CO2 in water. It allows us to produce things like low emission hydrogen and transform CO2 into low carbon products. And this reforming catalyst, it really allows us to address this whole hydrogen dilemma, which is, you know, everyone wants to produce a lot of hydrogen, but there's a trade off today between costs and emissions. And green hydrogen's great, but it's costly today. Electrolysis, requires a lot of energy thermodynamically um, it requires you know a lot of energy and in today's world energy is cost but it's also emissions if it's not coming from a renewable source you know if you're able to produce hydrogen from methane it's a lot more efficient things like methane pyrolysis you know show a lot of promise but right now they operate at a very high temperature they have some conversion challenges and chemically, the yields aren't great. So it really begs the question, well, can you produce hydrogen from both water and methane? And the answer is yes. Uh, it's actually been done for the last half a century. It's called steam methane reforming. Uh, it produces about three quarters of the world's hydrogen today. It's really good at producing a lot of hydrogen, but it's not very good at producing low emission hydrogen. On average, it produces about 11 to 12 kilograms of hydrogen for every kilogram of hydrogen you produce. So the real question is, well, can we change that? And this is where we come in. Taking our reforming catalyst, and we've developed this proprietary reforming process that allows us to take a variety of feedstocks like natural gas, propane, other liquids, CO2 and steam, and we can convert that into a number of different products such as low emission hydrogen, we can create low carbon products such as fuels, petrochemicals, even graphite for electric vehicle batteries. And at the heart of this process lies two fundamental steps. First is our low temperature steam reforming, and the other is our low temperature driver forming. And the advantages of this process is that because we operate at a really low temperature, we're operating about 50% less than conventional processes, we're able to save a lot in heat and a lot on utilities, and that translates into significant savings in terms of production costs. Also, because we're using less utilities, naturally we produce less emissions, but it also opens up the door where we can electrify this entire heating process, so we can eliminate up to 90% of all of the emissions. We also have been able to reduce a lot of the complexity, so a lot of the intensification, capital costs are able to go down, and we've developed this whole process from the ground up with a whole modular uh, idea in mind. So we can scale this from very small units, half a ton to one ton per day of hydrogen, all the way up to the thousands of tons per day. 
We're going to be commercial in 2025. We're currently developing a half-ton field skid. Uh, it's configurable for both hydrogen and CO2 utilization. We're going to be deploying that in the oil sands next year with one of our partners as part of our in-situ upgrading process. And uh, Nanostech, we're, we're an energy technology company. So the business model we're really pursuing here is really a licensing business model. It's a nimble asset capital light business model. It allows us to scale very quickly, but it also allows us to get to profitability much quicker, especially when you're dealing with a lot of this hard technology. Uh, what this means is we basically collect a license for licensing out the technology to an end user. We provide professional services fee, and we provide that catalyst as a supply longer term. Uh, happy to answer any questions. Thanks so much. Amazing. So we'll have five minutes for Q&A from the audience. So feel free to put your hand up if you have a question, and go ahead. Awesome. Thank you so much for that, Andrew. Thanks. I'm curious from a product perspective, for each of the different lines of catalysts that you walk through, how recyclable are they in general as far as reaction selectivity? And at what point would you need to essentially refresh your catalyst supply chain for some of the different categories? So in terms of lifetime? varies depending on the application. So, you know, whether you're upgrading oils, producing renewable fuels, but specifically our hydrogen catalyst, it has lifetimes of about four to five years, you know, on average. We've stress tested under a lot of conditions with sulfur, that sort of stuff. Uh, it exceeds what's available on the market today, and you get all of those other added benefits of lower temperature, better reactivity, and so forth. Awesome. Thanks. Hi, no, thanks for a great presentation. So I'm I just Can you want just to, oh. put your mic up a little okay. bit? Okay. Uh, perfect. Is that Thank better? You. Okay, That's great. Uh, thanks for such a great uh, presentation. Uh, I was just going to wonder, like, uh, what's your supply chain look like when you scale up the catalyst process? In terms of like catalyst supply? Yeah. So it's actually very, our supply chain is actually very easy because where we come in is we kind of focus on the last end of catalyst production. So we get all of the raw ingredients, which are pretty, very accessible. The supports with the actual catalyst sits on, we buy that from a third party, big, you know, global manufacturers that specialize in catalyst. We handle the very last part, kind of the magic where you actually produce the catalyst, put it on the support. Yeah. That doesn't take a lot of scale up, you know, bigger furnaces and so forth. Currently at our labs, we have a capacity of about half ton per day. Um, you know, with our pilots and so forth, that gets us through the capacity. But in terms of scale up, once we hit commercial, um, because we're kind of just, you know, focusing on that last end of the value chain, yeah. um, that's kind of where you make most of your money. Uh, the scale up is actually quite small for us. So we can kind of handle that supply chain challenge. Awesome, that's good to know, thank you. All right, thank you everyone. Thank you, Andrew. Amazing. So next up, we have Waste2H2 joining us on stage. And we have Arul, who is the chief technology officer there, to tell you a little bit more about his company. Welcome. Thank you. Can I have a click up, please? Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Arun Mani Devan. I'm the CTO at Waste2H2. We supercharge renewable natural gas production using our Waste2 hydrogen system. Now, the demand for renewable natural gas has only been increasing over the past decade. Just one utility, Fortis BC, has promised to include 30 million gigajoules of renewable natural gas as part of their 2030 mandate. However, the total RNG supply in Canada is less than 50% of that target. There's a huge supply gap here. So you might be wondering, where does renewable natural gas come from? Well. Renewable natural gas is produced when microbes digest organic matter anaerobically, that is, in the absence of oxygen. Now, this anaerobic digestion can occur on a landfill site, but that's not the most efficient way of producing RNG. So that's where the agricultural digesters come in, where the operating conditions can be optimized to produce more RNG. And you can see on the graph here the number of 
agricultural digester projects have only been going up over the past decade. This is an anaerobic digester, which you might have seen when driving past a large farm. The dome on the top there that collects biogas, which is 60% methane, useful gas, and 40% carbon dioxide, waste gas that has to be cleaned and removed before injecting into the natural gas grid. So even with the drastic increase in agricultural digester projects, we still can't meet the bottomless demand for renewable natural gas. So the question really is, can we improve existing anaerobic digesters to produce more methane? And our answer to that question is yes. By retrofitting our brew H2 system as a pretreatment unit ahead of the anaerobic digester, we achieve two things. One, we enrich the digest state with volatile fatty acids, which is a superior feedstock for the digestion process and improves biogas yields. And the second thing is, we produce hydrogen, and it's well known in the industry that hydrogen can be used to upgrade biogas. And therefore, we are a source of green hydrogen that can be co-located with an anaerobic digester. So based on our calculations, we can reduce the retention time of waste in the system by about 30% increase RNG yields by 60%, reduce emissions by 70%, and produce methane-rich biogas up to 90%, which will also reduce the operating cost in cleaning up this gas. Therefore, we supercharge renewable natural gas production from anaerobic digestion using our dark fermentation technology, which we are developing in collaboration with Dr. Jing Wang Hu at the University of Calgary. He's a biocatalyst expert and a well-known name in this field. We have a laboratory set up over there, and I would say that's a TRL level four. For hydrogen injection for biogas upgrading, we are partnering with Point3 Biotech. They are based in British Columbia. Now, we have signed an LOI with them to integrate these two technologies, and this has received tremendous attention from our customers, one of them being Rural Green Energy which is based off of Stanton Farms in southern Ontario. They process about 140 to 160,000 tons of organic waste, making them one of the largest anaerobic digesters in Canada. So we have signed an LOI with them to develop our pilot project at their site. So today at Stanton Farms, they produce sufficient RNG to heat 1,300 homes, and with our brew H2 system, we can improve that to 2,100 homes. Now, this is what we see as success at Stanton Farms, adding $6 million in revenue for our customers, and we have negotiated a preliminary payment of $2 million a year for the value proposition based on a fee-for-service model. Based on this business model, we can, um, we can recoup our costs within a payback period of 2.5 years. And this is the qualified team, advisors and partners with experiences in companies such as TC Energy, Spartan Controls, um, Enbridge Gas, and uh, GHT. So guess what? We are going to build hundreds of these brew H2 systems because there are thousands of anaerobic digesters in North America and in Europe. So we ask you to join us in terms of investment, engineering support as a joint development partner for our site um, in southern Ontario. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, so now we'll take a few minutes to uh, ha allow questions from our judges and also from the audience. So we'll have five minutes and we can start the time. Happy for your questions. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much for that, Arul. I'm curious to learn more about your business model um, as far as some of the details go. And then how are you planning on financing the upfront costs of your kind of upgrading units for your clients? Yes. So when it comes to financing, um, the kind of business model that we are looking at over here is a fee-for-service model. Like we are, As you said, we are taking the upfront costs, but we are collaborating with Rural Green Energy, who uh, is headed by Nick Henry. He's a well-known name, again, in the anaerobic digestion space, and uh, we are looking forward for their help um, in putting up the upfront cost. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. No, 
Uh, thanks again for such a great presentation. Uh, I was wondering, like, uh, can you elaborate about uh, like, what's your core IP of waste to H2 holes for, for this? Uh, can I come again, please? Yeah, what are the core IP intellectual property uh, yeah. waste to H2 holes? Yeah, so we are developing, as I said, we are working with Dr. Jing Wang Ku at the University of Calgary. So there, what we are doing is we are trying to one, test out the system, the dark fermentation system, by optimizing the temperature and the pH in the system. And our IP strategy extends further, uh, where we are trying to develop, um, uh, we are trying to develop uh, genetically modified microbes, which is also a patentable technology. Now, on the other side, wh where we have seen real interest is our ability to inject hydrogen back into the anaerobic digester and improve the uh, renewable natural gas yields. So that would require some kind of a specialized injection system and a catalyst system that is also part of our IP strategy. Awesome. That's awesome. Thank you. OK, great. Are there any other questions from the audience? Feel free to put your hand up. We have a couple of mics running around. OK, wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. All right. So the next startup we have joining us is Hydron Energy. And we do have Sohil, who is the CEO of the company, joining us today. So it's a pleasure to welcome you on stage. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everybody. Can you hear me? OK. Uh, so I'm from Hydron Energy. And what we do is trying to get that uh, carbon emissions down. And part of that problem is about 20% of that is hard to decarbonize sector. So these are the areas that you cannot use any uh, electrification or other ways of uh, reducing the carbon footprint. And for those, we still have to produce some sort of fuel that has very low or net zero carbon, and this is what we are doing here. So what I want to talk a little bit first here is to uh, set the stage and looking at what materials and methods developed by nature over millions of years. Uh, my background is engineering. I study engineering. but. I was always fascinated with how the biology takes care of the problems. And there are a lot to learn there. For instance, look at the ceramics that nature makes, the seashells, or look at the fabrics that nature makes, which is um, the, uh, the silk. The strength of the silk is higher than the steel. Also, if you look at, for example, gas separation, um, your body currently is reducing, removing oxygen from air and you're breathing nitrogen and oxygen. Oxygen gets separated. At the same time, your body actually rejects the carbon dioxide from your bloodstream. And it is doing that without the need for any cryogenic cooling, any uh, compressors, any um, high expensive, high energy content uh, uh, engineering. So we are doing that without any of those problems. So how this is happening and why we are actually suffering with the cost of carbon capture or cost of the refining our gases, our biogas to renewable natural gas or syngas to hydrogen. Very high cost. The refining is quite high cost. And because most of those refining technologies developed actually for oil and gas industry initially, but nature has been doing this for millions of years. So what we've done at Hydron, we actually uh, reverse engineer the nature. I don't know, it's the right word to say it, reverse engineer the nature. So what we have made a material that uh, exactly mimics the way that nature removes the carbon dioxide. Another set of material similar to what how hemoglobin works and removes oxygen from air. And they operate under atmospheric conditions. So why this is important? Well, whenever you want to try to increase the pressure, use compressor. Compressors are expensive. And the energy you use to compress the gas is quite, it's not cheap. So you need to pay for it. 
but when you're using this technology, there's no compression needed. And we are using waste energy to remove uh, or to regenerate the material. What really, at the end of the day, you have, you have a system that is a lot smaller, a lot cheaper, because we have less number of components, and also um, it is operating under atmospheric conditions, so you don't need to acquire ASME codes for vessels and then weld things for high pressure. So suddenly it changes the game. So everything becomes a lot cheaper, both from operation and from, from the perspective of the capital cost. The applications of this technology are not just for carbon capture. It could be used for biogas upgrading. This is the, currently, the current product we are selling is for biogas upgrading that has been developed already and we are selling it. There's another one for direct air capture, for rare gas production, but also for the hydrogen uh, purification. So whenever you have a syngas, a gasification process, or any other processes that produces the, nit the hydrogen, you need to purify the hydrogen to really high purities. And that is quite expensive. So we do that, and currently we are uh, working toward uh, bring the cost even lower for other applications. So as you can see, these are the live projects and our cost compared to them. Uh, so, so far company, I'm gonna just go over these. So far companies raised about uh, close to uh, $6 million and about six, another $6 million in grants that we raised. And uh, next round we are looking for another $5 million to get our production capacity. Uh, so we can actually start manufacturing the mid-size and the large-size unit also for the near future. Any questions? Wonderful. Thank you for that. Um, so we will open it up for questions now from the audience for another five minutes, and we can start the timer. Thanks for a great uh, presentation. Uh, so. You said like you have been you have been working on mostly focusing on RNG like a biogas upgrading. What would be your next focus? Like if you're moving your technology to the other area, what's your next focus on where you are at today? The one that we start the um, hydrogen is the one that we are doing currently. So the uh, biogas uh, as the biogas sales started this year, so we are working on developing hydrogen. Okay, is that for like a uh, um, blue hydrogen? Uh, what a, what a type of hydrogen separation you're looking at? It? So uh, in general, whenever you have, uh, let's say hydrogen produced from various technologies, including if you have a reformer, gasifier. Yes. Uh, yeah. So the technology uh, separation that we developed, it, it's not just only for CO2. For example, we can remove the CO2, CO, and other gases impurities, so to get to the high purity hydrogen from various gas mixtures. Okay, that's good, thank you. Yeah, no problem, thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Hill. Yeah. I'm curious, uh, when you're thinking about direct air capture from a carbon capture perspective, how are you thinking about scaling your system um, and what are the capital costs associated with standing up kind of additional carbon capture modules for you? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, Good question because it relates to, to the part that probably is the, everybody's problem because direct air capture is very expensive. Everybody knows. Um, uh, companies that they say they can do at $200 per ton or, or $300 per ton. I look at most of those. Um, the, um, the cost with this technology is north of $150 per ton, which is quite low comparing uh, to other technologies, and uh, the way that the economy of this works is that there are byproducts that we produce during the data care capture. Uh, so we are kick-starting using those byproducts uh, in order to do the first or second launch of the um, of the data care capture technologies. It's similar to how the internet took off. So internet, nobody was using it. Initially, it was used for some other applications. I don't want to mention what application, but initially some other application for, paid for the launch of the internet. Then internet became what we are using. I think with the direct air capture also, we have to look at those kind of scenarios because economic-wise, it's not really uh, profitable to do direct air capture. With the, 
Uh, with the point source, you can still deal with $30, $20 a ton. A bulk, bulk CO2 is about $20 a ton in a, in a pipeline. So you can compete you can, with some subsidy coming from government. But yeah, direct air capture is a tough one. And we have good plans, the business plan. We, I can't talk too much about it because it's, it's confident. Uh, but we can maybe uh, after this meeting, we can chat about that. Thank you. That's great. Thanks so much. Thank you. No one else? Amazing. Thank you so much. Any final questions from the audience? Okay. Yes. Have any of the stock brokerage firms there vetted you and decided to take you public? Uh, what firm? Can you repeat the firm name? Vancouver has a lot of stock brokers. Oh, yes. I know that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Have any of them vetted you? Are any of them willing to take you public? Yes, they approached, and I, uh, I declined. I, we are not ready to go public. This is too early. So there was some offers that I unfortunately had to decline that. I've seen a lot of startups going too early to public, and they go down. We want to make sure that we have a stable revenue from our product, which we are, do we are doing with the renewable natural gas. So, so far, most of my raise was from seed, uh, angels and uh, strategic partners. I haven't done to venture capitals. So next stage, I'm going to go venture capitals. And after that, hopefully, we'll do the public if it works. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sahil. Thank you. OK, so the last startup pitch for today is going to be Innova Hydrogen. And we have Matt joining us, who is the COO of the company. So welcome, Matt. Thank you. And your time will start now. OK. So uh, good afternoon, everybody. Matt DeRoche. I'm the Chief Operating Officer and co-founder of Innova Hydrogen, where we believe in clean energy for a cleaner future. So if we're serious about making hydrogen the clean alternative energy source of the future, we have to find a way to reduce the carbon intensity of how it's produced. We have to alleviate the issues of transporting it. And really, at the end of the day, we have to make it cheap enough for the customer so it's not inflationary for them to fuel switch. And Innova, we believe we have the solution where we are able to produce zero emission hydrogen from natural gas on site for the customer and at a price point that is equivalent to natural gas. Now, we're able to do this through our patent pending catalytic methane pyrolysis technology. This ties into the existing natural gas infrastructure, where then methane flows through the system, is subjected to heat, and our proprietary catalyst. Now, this produces zero scope one emission hydrogen and the critical mineral graphite, which is most commonly used in the production of EV batteries. And there's a shortage of it. This is all done without any water or oxygen inputs, and because all of the carbon is captured into a form of marketable synthetic graphite, there are zero on-site emissions. This allows us to produce clean, affordable, localized hydrogen for our customer. Now, both hydrogen and graphite have very strong growth, uh, growth demand curves. And because of us, or sorry, because of that, there have been a number of companies uh, in various stages of development that are working on their own methane pyrolysis technology. That being said, at Innova, we have one of the lowest levelized costs of production of hydrogen in the market. Not only that, we pr produce two products that will both benefit from these demand curves. We have a strong, diversified team spearheaded by our uh, CEO, Cami Giles, who uh, with her gritty work ethic, yet uh, modest background, was able to take one of her last ventures public in two years with a five times exit. Innova started up in uh, 2021. We closed a $2 million pre-seed round. With that, we've been able to file two international patents. We've also secured $3 million worth of non-dilutive funding. And we've actually advanced our technology to the point where we are currently building our first field pilot, which will be operational next year. From the start of 2024, we've actually secured $2 million from a strategic partner. With that partnership comes a joint venture for our first commercial project that will be uh, in construction in 2026. 
So I have lots of time, but the ask today is I'm uh, looking around the room for potential investors interested in, in uh, participating in our 5 million seed round, which we've already, again, secured $2 million worth. If you're interested, please reach out in the QR code you see attached or come see me afterwards. Thanks. Amazing. Great job, Matt. Um, so we'll have a few minutes for questions now and we can start the clock and go ahead with the judges. Yeah, no, thanks uh, for this very inform, in, like a very great uh, presentation. So I have a couple of questions for you. One is um, for the graph fed. After it's come out of your reactor, do you need the extra processing? So that's a great question. So it is a synthetic graphite that comes out, but yes, yeah. there are some other species in there. We actually just got approved and secured a $300,000 grant with the University of Calgary with their Battle and Batteries Metals Group, where they are actually currently are working on our sample graphite right now to purify it and put it into a lithium ion cell. Okay, that sounds awesome. And are you working with any partners on you know hydrogen side and the graphite, graphite side? So the partners on the hydrogen side, we do have a strategic partner. Uh, it's all under confidentiality agreement right now. They're very interested in the hydrogen for the, for the use of transportation and, and uh, as a fuel switch from natural gas to decarbonize their operations. Um, and then we are partnered with uh, ONET Group here in Edmonton, and that's our EPC of choice to build our first pilot unit. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks for that, Matt. Can you talk a bit about some of the margins you're expecting from the graphite uh, once you've produced it, once you've refined it, once it's ready for offtake? What are you expecting from a percentage basis there? Yeah, so it's we've we've had a lot of research into graphite. How graphite is made today? It uses pet coke. It's all sent over to China. It's refined into a synthetic graphite, and then it's brought back here and put into lithium cells. They buy that pet coke at a dollar fifty a kg. Our cost of our graphite coming out of our system is already graphite is $1.50 a kg. They sell their synthetic graphite after it's refined at $8 to $10 a kg. That's how much margin we have to work with. So we have a lot of strategic partners that, potential strategic partners that are out in the East Coast, you've probably seen them in the headlines, building massive battery plants and they don't know where their graphite is coming from. One of those, Powerco Volkswagen, their plant alone will exceed the amount of natural graphite mined in North America by five times. So they've pushed back the opening of that plant by five years. That's great. Yeah. And have you thought about any other potential um, you know, solid carbon products outside of just graphite for the battery supply chain? Is there anything else that's high value that you and the team are considering? So there is... You can, you can adjust the type of catalyst you use in the system. They'll give you different species, carbon nanotubes, carbon fibers. Those have applications, but the demand for graphite is here now, and so that's what we target. Uh, there is utility in carbon black, but most methane pyrolysis producers produce carbon black. And so that's, that's our differentiating factors, the graphite. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you so much, judges. Any other questions from any members of the audience? Okay, amazing. Thank you so much, Matt. Thanks. All right, so next up, it's my pleasure to introduce Shamil, uh, Head of Marketing and Public Relations at Edmonton Unlimited. She's our next speaker. I'd love to welcome her to the stage. All right, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Shamel Plus. I am the head of marketing and PR at Edmonton Unlimited. Edmonton Unlimited is the municipal innovation agency for the city of Edmonton. And our mission is to elevate local innovators and their companies towards international impact. So we do that through uh, of, uh, many ways. Uh, we provide uh, free programming and supports for innovators. We also connect entrepreneurs to various networks networks, community events, and opportunities at every stage of growth. Um, I'm thankful to be here and for to be joining uh, our friends at Plug and Play and Edmonton Global at the Global Hydrogen Pitch event. And I'm also joined by Sohil uh, from Hydrogen or from Hydron Energy and Matt from Innova Hydrogen. So uh, congrats to both of you for pitching and just having a fabulous pitch tonight. 
Thank you. How are you feeling? Great. Excellent. Yeah, good, thanks. Very good. Okay, so this is the last session of the day. Tell us a little bit more about your experience at the conference. What are some of your takeaways from this, uh, the last two days? Uh, well, actually, um, I arrived today morning, uh, and I can tell you that there uh, are many uh, uh, great uh, companies here. Uh, they have a lot to, to offer. And, uh, the, the level of the technology has been developed and, and uh, uh, presented in this conference that uh, when I see, and I compare with other uh, conferences that I attended for different uh, sectors, uh, I can see a lot more, um, uh, I would say, uh, futuristic or looking at more future, facing the future rather than lo looking back uh, at the old uh, technology. So this is very, very, um, uh, very promising to see that many, uh, many good companies and technologies here. I haven't finished going through and talking to everybody, but, but it is amazing. Yeah. It's great. Thank you. Yes, there's lots to see here, right? Absolutely. Yes. How about you, Matt? Yeah, so my background, I come from the oil and gas industry um, in hydrogen now and graphite. But when you look around, especially the, the expo, you see a lot of companies, a lot of names that are working on that transition. And so that's exciting to see, being an oil and gas guy myself, uh, living, breathing example of that transition that's happening here in Alberta. And it looks like uh, I'm not the only one. Definitely. And actually, for those that are just joining the live stream, uh, it'd be great for you both to maybe introduce yourselves a little bit about your your company and maybe give us a quick 30, 30 second elevator pitch. Oh, uh, you go ahead first. <laughs> <laughs> Not to put you on the spot. <laughs> yeah, so uh, Matt DeRoche, Chief Operating Officer, co-founder of Innova Hydrogen. Uh, what we do is we create more value out of the natural gas or methane molecule by splitting it into hydrogen and the critical mineral graphite, which will make uh, natural gas really the leading supplier of clean graphite around the world. Excellent. So my name is Sohel Kiavi. I'm a, a founder of um, Hydron Energy. I want to just say for 10 seconds something, 10, 15 seconds, something important that was my experience with clean energy. My background also is oil and gas. So I'm a refinery engineer. I did a refinery engineering for many years. And uh, when I really looked at where we are in terms of our planet, um, and then when you look at the photos of our planet Earth with a small, thin layer of atmosphere around it, and the rest of it is vacuum, and then 10 kilometers below you, you go down, then it's basically uh, hot magma. We are on this thin layer, and we are surviving. We are doing the amazing things, looking at the universe, which is 13.5 whatever billion light years. And we need to take care of it. I just want to say that. And that was the moment that it kind of I came to my senses that Perhaps I should put the rest of my life toward trying to see what we can do to help this planet uh, to survive for the next generation. There is no other Earth out there. Uh, I'm also a, a um, uh, amateur astronomer, so I like astronomy. I look at planets and things and, uh, and uh, stars. There's nothing out there. We are here. We need to take care of it. But that doesn't mean that we need to break down the economy, we need to make people suffer. So there has to be a balance. And what makes us resilient and is our intelligence, right? That's what our difference between us and other creatures of this planet is that we should use our brain and try to find the right balance between making a business, a good economy, out of turning this planet to be a sustainable place to live. So this is when I started a company called Inventus later on, became Savante, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm proud to say it's a billion dollar company in carbon capture. I exited that company in 2019 and I started Hydron Energy to look at uh, pre-combustion carbon capture. So 
it's important to take care of what we have for our future generations. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. Yes, both of you, great examples of innovating for impact. Um, you touched on this a little bit in your pitches around, you know, where you're at with your company, what you're looking for at this stage. My question to you is if you were given $10 million today, how would you use that to scale your business or your technology and why? That's a good question. I mean, to answer that, we, we have a plan uh, that goes uh, for the next five years, and that's another 50, 50, uh, 50 uh, million dollars, um, and another five years of 50 million dollars. We already have that in the plan, so I would immediately start pushing that two years ahead and, and getting that first part done, which is really creating the prototypes uh, and the working prototypes in the field. So. As a little story I'm going to tell you, and this is about first time when we start talking about our technology, our invention, and I know that same thing with, with, with my colleague here. First impression you get is that that's too good to be, that's not going to work. We know more than we, and this is a problem we face as innovators because the technology or the product we show people to the, to the community, to, 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 to industry, is something new, and most of the time, People say that is too good to be true. So the best way of ch kind of fighting that and putting that into rest so you can move to the next step is that to do a demonstration. That's always the, you can go into details of the science forever and people will argue forever, but once you have a box that is there and is working, here's my input, here's my output, then that puts everything to rest. After that, then the business as usual. So I would use that money to do my next prototype for the hydrogen uh, yeah. next field demonstration. Yeah, great Thank response. You. Matt, $10 million, how are yeah. you scaling? Yeah, real, real quick, uh, first thing I do is I double it. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of non-dilutive funding out there, and as a guy that didn't realize that I needed to write a lot of grants, that's really all, all I do now these days, uh, I can double that. And, and what I would do with that is I would, I would staff up and accelerate. That's as simple as, as it needs to be. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you both for joining us uh, on stage today. The judges have completed their deliberation and we'll hear what they have to say next. So appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. everyone. Okay, so now I'd like to introduce our judges and bring them on stage to discuss their deliberation process. So we have Tarek Elnagar joining us, who is a Ventures Associate at Plug and Play in our sustainability vertical. And then we also have Yoon Bai joining us from TC Energy. So welcome. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you, Kristen, and thank you to all the amazing founders for your pitches. It's uh, not easy to do this, certainly on stage or uh, you know in a space like hard tech. So uh, yeah, kudos to everybody who pitched today. Amazing. So I want to just start with maybe asking both of you what your process was when you're evaluating these startups in a pitch competition like this, and what led you to your ultimate decision for selecting the award and the winner for today. Yeah, I can maybe kick off from uh, you know more of a venture perspective. So when it comes to hard tech companies, um, VCs tend to be fairly allergic to you know high capital costs and you know more deep tech kind of industries like clean tech. Um, plug and play, we aren't one of those VCs. Uh, our portfolio is made 50% of hard tech companies. Uh, we're looking to double down into hardware, so it's not an area that we're necessarily afraid of. There's a few nuances in the space that uh, we think make it venture investable. The first that we look at very closely is scale. Um, with high, high capital costs, we look at how you're standing up new facilities. Um, are you scaling in a continuous fashion? Are you scaling vertically, or are you scaling horizontally? And you know, in a more of a more of a batch fashion. So, we like to see continuous scale. We like to see vertical scale. Um, and we want to make sure that through all this great technology, through all this great R and D, um, first and foremost, it's a clear business that comes through, which is why we kind of talk about margins and all these kind of things. And the last thing I'll, I'll mention about this space in particular, um, with hydrogen, there's often conversations around, uh, you know, different offtake options. Are you producing SAFs? Are you kind of uh, producing RNG? And we want to make sure that there's, you know, high margin at the end of the day. And after refining, after you come up with a final product, a there's a market for it, and b after all of your chemical processes are done, you're still looking at healthy margins for the business. 
Amazing. And then Yoon, from your perspective, coming from TC Energy, how do you evaluate startups for these types of pitch competitions? So uh, we work a lot with uh, startups and the emerging technologies, uh, you know, within the company ourselves, of course, we focus on what kind of value it brings to our assets, right? So, but, uh, you know, for in generic, for plug and play and for other startups to look into, uh, uh, you know, how to do the uh, selection, I agree with a lot of like Tarek was saying, and we are looking at a scale, you know, how much, like how big is the scale, what are the value proposition, what are the different products can bring into the revenue, and uh, especially for early stage uh, startups, we are looking into, do you have a solid, uh, like a scaling up plan or technology development plan? I saw like uh, some interesting, like, uh, you know, um, uh, slides there, like, uh, you know, all of those uh, wonderful works, uh, you know, those startups has been done. So it's, uh, it's great to demonstrate and show what have you, who are you partner with, uh, like, uh, you know, not only um, from the product perspective, but also from the supply chain perspective, financing perspective, right? Uh, what are you, how do you working with the ecosystem to bring your technology from where you are to the commercialization? Amazing. And then I'll just tell you a little bit about what the prize is for these startups. So they will be winning a spot in our next plug and play Alberta cohort in our sustainability program, which is really exciting. And then on top of that, they'll be getting one complimentary ticket to our plug and play summit, which is located in Sunnyvale, California at our HQ. So um, with that, maybe Tarek, I'll pass it over to you to make the big announcement. Yeah, thank you, Kristen. Um, again, one last time, congratulations to everybody who pitched today. It was certainly a difficult deliberation between myself and Yoon. Um, when it comes down to it, when we think about scale, we think about a business model, and we think about some of the more you know, uh, macro scale geopolitical factors that come into it, we think the battery supply chain from a, uh, a venture perspective is an area that's very interesting to us. And so that being said, um, Matt from Innova Hydrogen. Innova Hydrogen is the winner today, so congratulations to you. Why, thank you. And ultimately, um, just to give more of my own rationale, um, when we think about demand for clean energy, whether that's from a solar or wind or battery perspective, the demand for lithium-ion batteries is only going up, certainly. And um, when we think about all the different critical minerals that we're going to need to you know, integrate a more sustainable supply chain into domestically, um, we think that you know, complementing graphite production that's uh, clean and sustainable alongside hydrogen production is a very thoughtful approach to the space. So congrats to you and uh, thanks for your pitch. Great, thank you. This is my uh, technical team in the back row there, so I, I owe it all to those guys. Amazing, congratulations guys. Excellent, thank you so much Matt and congratulations and I'd like to welcome Chris back on stage to introduce our next speaker. All right, thanks so much, Kristen. What an amazing show that was. Again, Plug and Play is just an outstanding partner. Uh, there's really nobody better, probably in the whole world, at doing innovation and helping companies go from startup to scale. Uh, so I, again, I'm Chris McLeod here with the Edmonton Global, uh, here at the Canadian Hydrogen Convention on the Edmonton Global stage inside the Edmonton Region Hydrogen Hub. We've tried to put as many names there as we can, Mustafa. Uh, and we're joined by Mustafa Sahin, who's our Executive Vice President investment and trade. Welcome, Mustafa. Thank you, Chris. All right, so we, we've got one last little interview we're going to try to do with Nick Samian, who's with DMG, one of the main organizers of this. But while we're waiting for Nick, and I'm sure he's got maybe eight or 9,000 things on the go, uh, I thought maybe we just have a quick conversation with, uh, with Mustafa. So you've been helping delegations from, from Poland, from Taiwan, from Japan, I think Korea. Can you just talk a bit about what you've heard from you know, some of those delegations about being here in the Edmonton region this week. I'll give um, um, an anecdotal example. So one of the gentlemen from the Polish delegation, I was speaking to him uh, near the end of the reception last night as he was on his way to go outside and have a smoke. And he <laughs> said, and I asked him, I said, how's it going? And he said, this has been amazing. And he's part of their investment and trade organization. And he said, you know, we go to a lot of these things. I've probably been to 80 or 90. He said, this is honestly probably one of the top three I've been to. He said, our companies, the connections they've made, the opportunities, the way we've been welcomed, the depth of quality that was here, 
far exceeded their expectations. So that's one anecdotal example. Um, I, I think the Japanese uh, have had a, a very good come on experience on, so far. Keep talking. Um, we're, we're just sharing the love about what a great conference this is. So it's perfect timing to come on you in. You know, the Japanese have, thanks had, for having me. Have, have had a great experience. The size of their delegation speaks to that, not just the yeah. size, the fact that we've had, you know, the chairman of Kawasaki Heavy Industries, the, you know, the fact that they're coming here and having the caliber meetings, not just with industry, but with government is really important. And, and the other thing I'll just say really quickly is, because Nick's now here, is this whole idea was born on September 1st, 2021, in the boardroom of the old Edmonton Global Office in a meeting with Nick and his colleague David Gores, who aren't here. And they pitched this idea of doing a hydrogen convention in Edmonton. And I knew of DMG's track record, and I said, yes, I committed on the spot because I knew what they would do. And so when we see what we've achieved today, they said year one, we might get 1,500 people. I think 500 was the first number we talked about. <laughs> and we've certainly and, done way better than that. And, and so it's not just the number of people, the range of people, the fact that this is the largest end-to-end -end hydrogen convention in North America, I think is amazing and it's a testament to the partnership that exists here. And the international interest is the walking the walk in yeah. terms of the international interest because it's not easy to get here. No, so absolutely. the fact that they're getting here is a big deal. Yeah, thanks so much for that, stuff. And so again, I know I actually introduced Nick before, before you walked in. Uh, so Nick is... Uh, really the key person we work with uh, for uh, Mustafa don't run away just stay in here no uh, really is the key person we work with uh, to, to build the Canadian hydrogen convention uh, carbon capture Canada which runs in the fall he's also deeply involved in events all over the world including uh, including Audipac gas tech uh, you know some of the biggest shows in the world uh, and it's just such an honor to, to work with you and, and learn from, from what you guys have done. So first, just want to say thank you for all that you're doing and all you're doing for the Edmonton region. Thank you, Chris. Um, it is it is a real honor working here. And just picking up, um, you know, Mustafa talking there, so we always think some of those words are a bit overused. You know, partnership, you know, and but I think partnership, and I t when I think about that, when we come here to work with Edmonton Global and to work with the region here, it's partnership and it's friendship. And this is a town that you can come into and get business done. Absolutely. It's people that have ambition, there's imagination here, and it's not so much of coming into a room, just like the story you told, <laughs> where let's have six or seven reasons why we can't do something. Instead it was, in this picture, that particular case, there, was, there wasn't a lot of events running. I'd say yeah. there was none, actually. It was about when we can, this is what we might be able to do. And from that moment, that's when we knew we had the right seeds here. And yeah, 500 people was quite an ambition, Chris, if, yeah. you, if we remember back then, and look at what we've accomplished today. So I, I think partnership and friendship and imagination are three of the big themes here when we come up to uh, work on what I'll say is, is my favorite show by far, yeah. uh, what we've had. And the last couple of days here have just been incredible. And contextualize that. How many shows a year do you run around the world? DMG Events is, is, uh, organizes more than 100 global events in 40 countries. <laughs> yeah, per year. There's only 365 days, so it's that, that's a lot of events, especially when events are you know, two to four days long. Uh, okay, so um, and we could tell so many stories, but like, I, I think one of the, the pieces, just to pick up on Mustafa's first of that, that sub meeting in September a couple of years ago, uh, I think you said to us, get some partners together, get some money together, we'll talk. And I think, you know, within a couple of hours, we'd called you back and said, here's the money, here's the partners, like, we're in. You know, literally the next day, you said, okay, let's book dates and make it happen. Like, the Edmonton region is a place where you can build things. You can build from the nanotech to the mega project. And we really do it because of partnerships. And again, we've used that word a lot, but it's this belief that we can build things and make things happen. So we just love that you're such a partner in that. I'd ask Mustafa what he's heard from international delegates that are here, you know, CEO of Kawasaki, Heavy Industries, and others. I'm always curious from your perspective, I mean, you're talking to people all over the world. Do you have any big takeaways from what's gone really well this year, things that you're proud of? 
Yeah, thanks. And I mean, I love the international perspective. And thanks for the for the call out. As um, as we know, as we work with you both at Edmonton Global, and, and that international focus has been something from the yeah. very beginning. And you know, just commenting very briefly on what I've taken out of the comments. Um, you know, one of the ones I like the best is just wow. Yeah. You know, wow, walking into the convention center, or wow, that's such a meeting I had of people that aren't talking about pie in the sky, something that may or might or someday. It's about how can we get business done right now. And yep. this is a region where, you know, people are wanting to bring in capital, people wanting to big, bring in ideas and big ideas. So that's certainly a perception that we continue to get and even more so this year from the international delegates coming through. Um, and delegations, excuse me. W one of the bigger themes I'm really excited about this year, and we're terrible, aren't we, as we look at the closing yeah. day here as we think to the future, but this is, you know, we're, we're looking forward. We keep hearing about that demand economy and I, every time, so many great sessions that we've been talking about and the activity that's being done, uh, my ears perk up when I hear those words uh, because that, again, is more opportunity and more imagination. So I've really been encouraged about some of the great initiatives that are happening and I'm, we've been talking about those, but there is some really good ones here, including yep. ones, Chris, I know you're spearheading yourself with things like the Vehicle Challenge and others. I think we're just getting started. And I, I think we've got a couple of companies that are going to actually do a drive across the country now. We've, after our conversation last night, we've had a couple of follow-ups. Mustafa is lining up money. We're lining up vehicles. We're lining up fuel. We may just have something that goes maybe from the East Coast to the U.S. through Edmonton into the West Coast, either Canada, maybe Canada and U.S., to make the Hydrogen Convention something that's a really cool focal point of that. So well, no moss on no us, live. because I dare say, we just thought of that, and <laughs> we've got a, we've got meetings set up next yeah. week. And he, you're right. Yeah. Uh, it's wonderful. Yeah, we'll make things happen. I think, I think it's also important to remember that, especially when you look at Edmonton's history, uh, you know, traditional territory of so many Indigenous peoples and yeah. traditional meeting grounds, that this event has become a bit of a meeting ground for multiple levels of government yeah. and industry and Indigenous, everybody to come together to help have a part in building that next generation future of energy. And I think that's really important too. This is such an open and accessible place and space that we've created that allows for those conversations. And that doesn't always happen either. Yeah, I'm gonna pick up on that because I think two things that were really interesting from my perspective on that. We had our first head of state. Uh, this year we had the president of Poland. We had a very large delegation